Hello, friends. We are very honored to have with us Doris Peltier, Community Engagement Coordinator with the Feast Center for Indigenous STBBI Research, which stands for Sexually Transmitted Bloodborne Infections at McMaster University in Hamilton, Canada. Doris has been very actively involved with the Indigenous HIV movement in Canada for almost two decades. And she's also a Community Advisory Council member with the Vakabinus Bryce Institute for Indigenous Health at the Dala Lana School of Public Health, University of Toronto. Welcome, Doris. Hi. Uh, Doris, you have been at the forefront of the Indigenous HIV movement in Canada for the past 20 years or so. What, according to you, are the social and structural barriers that affect access to HIV care and control of Indigenous communities? Well, that's a really good question. And um, um, I guess the biggest uh, uh, social barrier would be um, stigma. We still have stigma in our communities, uh, in our First Nations communities and in our Inuit communities as well, when it comes to um, uh, HIV and AIDS. Um, you know, people are still believing some of the, the myths that are out there. And uh, so there's still a, a lot of education, educating of the community that needs to happen. Um, so stigma is the biggest uh, barrier at the moment. And um, the other, uh, the other uh, big barrier at the moment is, uh, you know, the, the funding has been um, incrementally uh, reduced uh, in the last 10 years. Um, and, you know, like all around the world, HIV exceptionalism has been kind of always been on the table, you know, where people are, you know, giving priority to HIV. And, um, and then the funding started to shift. Um, and uh, HIV was no longer a priority on, on the table, despite the fact that, um, you know, we, we still ha have many people in our indigenous community testing positive. And um, so we, we've got, just when we, we felt like we were starting to, uh, um, you know, begin to have some successes, then the funding got pulled back. And um, in terms of the, uh, the global goal of 90-90-90, we've been saying in the last um, 10 years, well, not, not quite that long, the last six, seven years, we've been saying um, we, we will not be able to be part of meeting that global goal because of those kinds of things, you know, the stigma still needs to be addressed. Um, and um, the, uh, the funding as well has decreased. So just as we're heading out the gate, um, you know, and along with everybody else, these things uh, become barriers uh, to our successes. And um, we still have a lot of work to do in our indigenous communities, um, you know, and we also have, uh, uh, a uh, opioid epidemic happening in Canada right now. And uh, that's exasperating, uh, you know, all of it. So it's like we have converging pandemics right now with COVID-19 and, um, and then the opioid uh, epidemic. And, uh, and I don't know if I, I don't think I, I should still call the HIV AIDS uh, 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 a pandemic or an epidemic, um, even though uh, we, we're, we're testing, um, many indigenous people are still testing positive, but the government priorities have really changed. And um, so these are, you know, the social, the biggest social barrier would be stigma. And in terms of structural barriers, there's uh, the funding, of course, and then, uh, you know, also at the global level, the 90, 90, 90, we feel like we're the 10, 10, 10. And uh, globally, you know, uh, 
it's uh, that's a pretty lofty goal. And, and I think some of us said that when uh, that global goal was first uh, announced and, um, and we're kind of in the back trying to uh, keep up, but uh, I don't think we're gonna, we're gonna meet that target. Uh, although there have been improvements in terms of uh, the 9090 goals, um, um, the other uh, big structural barrier when it comes to uh, our response of uh, indigenous HIV in Canada is, is uh, within the healthcare systems itself. Um, we're dealing uh, quite often with uh, uh, structural racism uh, within the healthcare settings. And, and so a lot of people um, are reticent to access uh, services within healthcare systems, which uh, does not uh, do well for, for, for the global goals. Um, so we've got a lot of work to do in that area too, but it, it's harder when you're dealing with a system, you know, with a, a structural system like the healthcare system. Um, you know, um, it's, it's a system that's uh, designed to, um, to work in a particular way um, and it may not even work well for, for our communities, you know, um, with the racism within healthcare settings. So those are two or three of the uh, areas that uh, I would like to tell you about. And, and how have they, they must have obviously impacted prevention and treatment services uh, for HIV and tuberculosis uh, in the indigenous population. Uh, in what manner? Have they well, um, we, we are doing, um, we are working in the area of prevention. Um, and um, at one point as, as a person that's living with HIV myself, like um, we were, we as persons living with HIV really felt that we should be part of that, you know, uh, prevention piece because we know what it's like to live with HIV. And so the, there's good prevention work that's happening and, um, um, and that kind of points, points a way to treatment, you know, access to treatment uh, for HIV. TB uh, is another kind of uh, uh, issue um, that we at the national level haven't really addressed, uh, despite the fact that uh, TB is um, quite high, especially in the north, in the north, in the circumpolar region. Um, you know, they've got high rates of TB um, happening in, in the north and um, and it's now kind of trickled into like uh, little pockets within the urban settings. And so we're only now responding to uh, tuberculosis, but I feel like we, we've, we've been doing well in terms of the prevention piece. And, uh, um, you know, um, but uh, I'm losing my train of thought here. Um, what I wanted to mention was, uh, um, you know, we as Indigenous people uh, do not look at uh, disease as just the disease or um, our response is holistic and uh, our response to uh, HIV uh, is holistic. And, and when I think about the 90-90-90, like one of my elders recently told me, uh, you know, uh, when he, he asked me to explain the 1990 goals, uh, the global goal, and then he says, that's only addressing the physical. It's not addressing uh, the mental, the emotional and the spiritual parts of uh, uh, the human being. And, um, you know, in our pursuit to, uh, to, to be successful in terms of the numbers, um, you know, I had to agree because we're forgetting those parts of people. 
um, quite often we're only interested in numbers and the success that, uh, that the numbers tell us, but we're not dealing with uh, uh, the emotional, the spiritual and the mental side of uh, the people that are living with uh, HIV or even tuber tuberculosis for that matter. And uh, so how that came to light um, is through the COVID the COVID-19 when it, when it happened, when the pandemic happened globally, um, again, uh, the systems uh, <coughs> were responding to the physical. So they developed the vaccine. So there were a lot of people <coughs> that suffered because of the lockdown. And those mental health issues from being locked down haven't been dealt with yet. You know, and that's just uh, exasperating uh, uh, the situation in terms of uh, somebody that might be living with HIV and they're now having to deal with COVID and go into lockdown. And, uh, you know, things are hard as it is, you know, things are hard enough as it is for uh, some of my peers that are living with HIV, you know, and we have. Uh, homelessness happening in Canada as well, you know, and um, uh, I know a lot of, uh, of my peers that are homeless. And so there's a housing issue as well. Like housing is, uh, is, is good for your health. You know, you can take care of yourself if you're uh, housed, but if you're not housed, what you're doing is you're just trying to survive and um, um, and I think the biggest uh, piece in all of this was is all of you know is colonization and and the impact of that uh, that has rippled uh, that's still rippling down um, for our people. So it's very multi-layered. Um, you know you talk about the social determinants of health, uh, but from our perspective, as Indigenous people, we, we have Indigenous social determinants of health that we, uh, that we, we were promoting. And I think they're, they're being accepted now, but they're good for us to address uh, HIV and any of the other uh, epidemics that are happening. Those uh, Indigenous social determinants of health still resonate. So that, very that was a lot I, I just told you. No, no, that, that's so very true, Doris. And like even in our local Hindi language, we have a saying that the three most important basic needs of a human being are what we say, roti, kapra, or makan. That is food, clothing, and shelter, a roof yeah. over our head. And that's what you have pointed out so very well. Uh, Doris, can you please share some of the unique sexual and reproductive health needs uh, including for HIV prevention and related services of Aboriginal women in Canada and elsewhere. Because I feel women are impacted uh, in a different way. They are far more impacted. Yes, in Canada, uh, Indigenous women uh, are overrepresented still within the uh, uh, um, HIV rates in Canada. and. Um, and this has, uh, in the beginning, it, uh, it, uh, before we knew that it was still possible for women to have children, you know, <coughs> a lot of women <coughs> were not having babies. For fear of uh, vertical transmission, you know, and uh, but things have improved um, in terms of sexual and reproductive health needs for women. You know, women are have the information, and they've had the information about reproductive health uh, probably for the last uh, <coughs> eight years. Um, 
and maybe even longer. And they've had the information about uh, the different ways you can you can have a baby, you know. And but now with uh, U equals U, that really supports uh, sexual and reproductive health needs, you know, of uh, the women. Um, and uh, so. Uh, uh, I think um, U, U equals U, when it was uh, first launched and that information came out about U equals U, you know, if you're undetectable, uh, you know, you're untransmittable. Undetectable equals untransmittable. You know, there was a big celebration around that but uh for women it was different like we had to stand back for a bit when that when that came out and uh you know we were asking the question about breastfeeding for example you know uh does that apply to breastfeeding as well you know if yeah we know we now know we can have children and but do we know if we can breastfeed them? Um, and so, so more research has to be done around uh, breastfeeding. Um, and I, I don't think we've had those conversations yet around um, you know, that connection to you equals you. There is cause for celebration for that. You know, and, uh, but women's priorities are different from men's priorities when it comes to you equals you. We're more interested in the sexual and reproductive health needs uh, of the women, and uh, and uh, there are um, global documents like uh, the WHO has a uh, um, uh, consolidated guidelines on sexual and reproductive health and justice for women living with HIV, and uh, and it's a big global document and. Uh, and I also am part of the Women Living with HIV Advisory Group at the WHO. And, um, and my role on that uh, advisory body is to uh, work within, work in country to support people to uh, implement those guidelines. And uh, so right now, uh, our national organization got funded uh, and they're doing global research um, on the sexual and reproductive rights of uh, women living with HIV. And they broadened the definition of women within that project. Um, so it, it's a different approach. It's a new approach that's very different from maybe mainstream. But really, that's what the implementation of those guidelines is about. It's really about taking that tool and making it relevant for our community. And so that's the work that's going on globally right now. And, um, and uh, I was also involved with uh, a large uh, national cohort study that's uh, been about 10 years, a little over 10 years on, on the journey. It had three waves of data collection that it did. And it was around, uh, and, and they had a lot of uh, sexual and reproductive rights uh, uh, that they addressed in that uh, large research project. And many of our indigenous women took part in that cohort study as well. So we are now, uh, so we, that big cohort study, which was mainstream, uh, had engaged, uh, over a thousand indigenous women in their cohort study. And uh, the, uh, the nominated principal and investigator approached me at one point and said, Doris, how can we work together? You know, you know I, I had uh, uh, co-developed with a advisory committee here in Canada, uh, Voices of Women advisory body uh, a five-year implementation, a five-year strategy on HIV and AIDS for women. And she approached me at that time and she says, we should work together. And uh, so I was invited to be part of their, on their steering committee for that cohort study. And, uh, 
And I thought, hmm, it's interesting, you know, when uh, a mainstream person says, I'd like to work with you, you know, um, and uh, because you have to be, you have to, you have to be cautious sometimes because quite often people will come into your community with that savior mentality. They, they wanna come and save your community. But she, she I had to think about her, her request to work together. And I thought, I think she comes from a good place. She's an epidemiologist and uh, she's, uh, she'll have a lot to learn in terms of working with us. So eventually we said, yes, yeah, we, we'd like to work with you. And because uh, she is very influential as an epidemiologist, Canadian, you know, in the Canadian um, HIV uh, uh, research world. And um, so we've been working with her for 10 years. But what happened was we asked her, we would like to work with you, but, but isn't it time? that uh, indigenous people translate indigenous data. And you've got a lot of data of indigenous women living with HIV from your cohort study. We would like to have the opportunity to translate that data, uh, we told her. So, uh, so she ha they handed back the, the indigenous women's data to our national organization. And we're now in the process of uh, translating that data. We're still working with them, but we have our own uh, indigenous scientists involved, you know, like uh, that are familiar with statistics and all of that. So, so all of that's happening, but it's been a slow moving process. And, uh, but uh, that was very honorable of her uh, to do that, you know, to hand it over. And it was handed over to us in a ceremony because we're very ceremonial people as indigenous people. We, we, uh, we put ceremony into everything that we do. So, so we're involved in the uh, sexual and reproductive health through that cohort study. And then there's a global study that's going on, but there, uh, and you know, there's been uh, pockets of work that's been done, um, but I'm hoping now it'll really uh, begin to move forward a lot quicker. But it, it has been, it must have been very gratifying for her also to be working with you and with your people. So it, it was not a one-way gratification, Doris, because all forced to you for all the hard work you have been doing. Uh, right. Well, she brought her whole team as well, of scientists as well. So it's, it, we look at it as a learning opportunity, you know? Um, and quite often when people come into your community, like I said earlier, they come in, I wanna help. Well, um, okay, you wanna help? Okay, what does that, you're thinking, what does that mean? What do they mean they wanna help? We've had a lot of people who come, in, come into our community and say they wanna help and uh, they only come and extract information and disappear. Well, if you wanna help and you wanna learn about working with us, there's going to, it's going to involve a lot of listening at the beginning, listening to, to our ways of doing things. And, and then we'll, we'll learn together how to work together, you know? And so it's been a really good process uh, working with that team and that work is still ongoing. I'm a co-chair for that national um, uh, advisory body that's, that's doing the translating of that uh, quantitative data because it was like a um, huge survey, probably that took uh, maybe an hour and a half to do the survey for all the women that, that were part of that. And there were three waves of that survey. It was uh, probably the largest cohort uh, study that's been done about women's uh, sexual and reproductive health. And uh, the whole intent was to uh, approach it from a strength space and, uh, and, uh, hope, and to affect uh, healthcare systems in terms of uh, working with women in a better way. So it's, it's a really good study. Uh, one last question, Doris. Uh, the theme of AIDS 2022 is uh, re-engage and follow the science. What is its relevance? in your context? 
today. Um, yes. yes. I think it's very relevant. Um, you know, people think that science is absolute and finite, but, um, and it is in, in some cases, but science also evolves. And, uh, and I'm working now with the FEAS Center for Indigenous SDBBI Research. And, um, and when, when you think about STBBIs, HIV is under that umbrella. And at the FEAS Center, uh, we're working with the four pillars of, you know, uh, of, of science. And that would be uh, um, basic science, clinical science, epidemiology, and social science. And as Indigenous people, we are storytellers. We feel that the, the experience of people, uh, the experience and the stories that people bring to the table in the form of a story is very important. And for many years, we were only doing qualitative, uh, qualitative research, which is really, uh, you know, asking questions of people and getting their story. And that was uh, the qualitative research. And, uh, and within the, the, the research system, like within the research world, realm, people were not really, people were saying, well, it's all fine to hear the story of people. And these stories are powerful and everything, but we really need evidence. So we started moving more into doing, beginning to include the uh, quantitative uh, research, which falls into those science realms, right? And uh, it's very relevant these days. Um, and I could equate the science to our, our understanding of indigenous knowledge. You know, indigenous knowledge evolves. It's evolved over the years. And science also evolves. It's not static. There's always new research that uncovers uh, something uh, in science. And, and same with our community. When we, when we think about indigenous knowledge, it's, it evolves as well. There's always something new that we uncover uh, that might be old knowledge, but it's now kind of uh, um, in today's context, you know, it, it's, it evolves. And so I think it's very relevant uh, in terms of re-engaging in the science, particularly now, um, you know, um, when we're in this converging pandemics, uh, science is really important. And, and I like what that elder said, you know, when I told you about that elder saying, um, mainstream only address the physical. They don't, they don't address the whole person. And, and more and more of that's starting to happen though within uh, some of the other research, uh, like even that cohort study I was involved with, um, they're looking at those pieces as well. Um, but it has to, that has to happen across the board. We have to address these things ho holistically uh, and still do the science. Like, um, yeah, I, I've been involved in scientific research for quite some time as a community um, person on advisory boards. And, and I had to uh, roll up my sleeves and uh, learn about the sciences uh, uh, much more in depth um, when I was uh, reviewing uh, protocols for clinical trials uh, that were happening in Canada and reviewing their applications to, to do clinical trials. So I jumped in uh, with both feet and, uh, and did that for five years. So science for me is very important and it is relevant uh, to today's context but it will continue to evolve as well, much like our indigenous knowledge. So well said, Doris, and many thanks for such an informative and energizing conversation. Uh, 
as part of a storytelling, as you mentioned. So I have been through this uh, storytelling of yours today, and so are our viewers. And I'm really grateful that Doris, despite her illness, and uh, she's just recovering from a bout of COVID, and I can understand what uh, she must be going through. So all force to you, uh, Doris. And uh, thank you very much, friends. We were listening to Doris Peltier, Community Engagement Coordinator with the Free Center for Indigenous STBPI Research at McMaster University. And thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Namaste. 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 Thank you.